topic tonight is fire scouting uh, and uses and uh, I guess instructions of how to use it. Alan Benson, uh, in 1987, founded uh, Specialty Building Products, uh, the only company in the upper Midwest to focus on service and sales of fire stopping products. Uh, Mr. Benson uh, worked with all the leading manufacturers uh, in the uh, fire stop products and is recognized as a top authority in the world market. Previously, he served as the CEO of Shabam, Shannon. Inc., a company specializing in aerospace and industrial hydraulic seal. He began, he began his career in 1967 as an aeronautical engineer with Northwest Airlines and later Continental Airlines. Uh, Mr. Benson is a certified Firestop installer, uh, instructor, and he's a member of CSI and the local ICEO chapter. Uh, Mr. Benson holds a BS degree in aeronautical engineering from the University of Minnesota. He has a wife, Jody, and three children. Uh, I just have a question here. How did you uh, go from aeronautical engineering? <laughs> well, I moved around a little bit. I was in California and in the Shannon Company. And they had a, they liked me, they wanted to be able to run the company, they moved me to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then I had a daughter and I wanted to move back to Minneapolis. And I made a mistake, mistake that I thought I knew enough about business after running one that I could start my own. And uh, uh, it, it's been very interesting. I picked an industry that I said wasn't as big as aerospace. I said, well, building industry isn't big. There must be a niche there someplace I can find that's technical enough to keep everybody uh, interested. Nobody wants to get involved in it. Maybe I can help sort it out for other people, i.e. have some value there. So I can add value thing, to things by knowing how everything works, operates, and stay current on it. So everybody else does. I imagine most of the companies here don't want to have a full-time fire stop engineer on their staff. So uh, I, I try and be a resource for anybody that wants to do that. So I, came, you know, around the United States back to Minneapolis and started my own business. Leave it up to you. Okay. I have to tell Jody not to write such a long introduction. I didn't know anybody didn't take it seriously. I never could read it. <laughs> since since uh, we're mostly interested in, in uh, fire suppression, I thought I'd and fire stopping, and some people think that maybe that's an either or thing. But my analogy in coming out of aerospace may be good, bad, or indifferent. Um, if you're going to go get on a plane to Hawaii, you have a choice between a one engine plane and a two engine plane. You're probably going to take a two engine plane. Now, because who knows what's going to happen, how good everything is going to operate and function. But, uh, and that's the way I kind of think of fire suppression and uh, fire stopping. I think they're both necessary, and they're both very good things, and uh, one doesn't, uh, you know, replace the other. They're both necessary, and that's the way the codes are. But some people uh, think fire stopping is all smoke and mirrors. Uh, they don't take it seriously, but hopefully after we run over things a little bit, uh, you can see some of the stuff that goes into it. How familiar is everybody with fire stopping besides, uh, well, how, how familiar are you with you? Delved into it, had to do anything with it. Uh, other words, walk around the pipe occasionally. Or? <coughs> That's probably the limit of my knowledge. Oh, no, I, I specify it every day, probably, and I don't know what I'm specifying. Okay. Well, we'll uh, get into that and we'll try and uh, run through some of the things pretty quickly. And we don't have a whole lot of time. So, what I'm going to use is, uh, as mentioned, I'm a 3M installer trainer, and except a non 3M employee that I have my own business. I've done it long enough where uh, they keep me current and I can do that for them. And I also uh, I have other manufacturers available and I've worked with almost all of them. Uh, but 3M has an awful lot to bring to the table and that's the, that's the one that you know, I'm primarily with. So, um, What I'm going to do is show you a couple of new things just for the heck of it. I forgot to bring them up front. but. Thanks. <clears throat> One thing I brought 
draws a letter over. Everybody can have one if they want one. That way you won't. You can't throw my card away. <laughs> so anybody wants one, or anybody leaving early should take one. Um, also, uh, companies like 3M have a lot to offer in that, and we'll get into a little bit. They have CD ROMs, you know, that uh, go over fire stopping. You can look up applications here. It has a help in the in the search function for what you want, and it's also updatable. You can go on the internet, hit the web, go update, and it'll update it just like you're updating a catalog. Except it's a little bit easier, and you probably would do it more often than you update your catalog. So I have some of those, and anything that anybody wants, just leave a note with me, and I'll try and get it for you. You know, three M catalogs too. Everybody should have their. Uh, uh, library updated periodically, and I'm supposed to go to Bishad Cooley and update there soon. Not that I'm overdue. Yes, sir. How is 3M's uh, website for getting all this information? It's just about as good, except it doesn't have as good a help function for finding what you want. For instance, if you go in there, it's kind of hard to go. I have concrete, plastic pipe, you know, a two hour wall, ding, 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 and get you a solution. The CD ROM helps you do that, and it goes a little faster. And then you have the majority information on your laptop or with you at all times. You don't have to necessarily get on the website. It's of course a little bit faster. Unless you have your team on or something like that. <coughs> Other things that are uh, changing that uh, might apply to yourselves would be is they're coming out with cast in and replace uh, devices. So post tension floor. You want to run a pipe through it, here's a rubber lip to stop the gas, you just cast this in place, and you don't have to do anything to it again. You just put your pipe in there. There's one for plastic, there's one for metal, and they go inch and a half to uh, four inch. At this time, they're probably going to six in the near future. That's just, you know, just for your information so you know there's new things, because you probably showed up here and you said this is going to be all old stuff. So <laughs> figure I'd bring out something new anyway, just to uh, keep you confused anyway. Uh, also here, you have rip-off tabs. You don't have to cut the thing even. You can, if you have a gorilla grip or a pliers, you can just rip this off to the height you want. One side metric, one side uh, the Is that listed? Yeah. yeah it's got uh, a number of systems and they're always being refined and improved. And if you want them, you may have to go on the website to get them. And I can tell you where they are. I can get you copies if you need any. Happy to do that. How much do they run? I do. How much do they run? Um, I think three M price them so it'd be a little less than having a guy go back and fill a hole. <laughs> uh, they vary. For instance, uh, the next big project we're going to have is probably going to be that Grant Park uh, Tower downtown, the two open screens, and uh, they're going to range like seven fifty to fifteen dollars, somewhere in that range. Uh, it depends on the quantity and uh, you know how much uh, you know 3M wants a job or a high-profile job like that or something. But uh, they're they're not as bad as you think. Can you pass it around? Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, I'll pass another one around too. This one has a lid on it, and what you do is when you rip it to height, you put the lid on, rip it to height, put the lid on, key to one place, and then you pour the concrete. And you just hit it with a hammer, knock, go, knock the lid, break the lid, and then you're ready to go. That way you uh, you don't have to put gray tape over the top or anything. So that's one, and uh, another one. I don't have the lid on that one. If you feel so inspired, you can try and try and rip one of those. <coughs> We're not going to talk about the new pillow because you're not going to use pillows. This is a new plastic pipe device. If you have larger plastic pipes, more than likely for metal pipes, you hardly have to do it because metal pipes don't really disappear in a fire. Uh, copper, steel, whatever, doesn't uh, disappear. But plastic, occasionally you need a metal pipe. Rule of thumb is anytime you're over two inch in open area, if you're hitting a wall, that's different. But in an open area, if you're over two inch, you usually need a device. So it's kind of a rule of thumb in plastic. I had a little thermic 
into heaven. But I have some CDs and everything like that, so everybody can have it. Then 3M has their catalog, and they take it right out of the UL, verbatim. Other manufacturers sometimes make their own CAD drawings, which are nice and a little easier to read sometimes, but the Bible is the UL book, and that's what they tend to use. And once you know how to read those systems, I'll go into it a little bit, they actually go pretty easy. So uh, that's just the way they've chosen to do it, so verbatim. I.e., you give that to a building official, you know, he kind of almost has to accept it. I suppose if one wanted to take legal recourse, he could ram it down his throat and force him to accept it. But most contractors don't do that for obvious reasons. You have to develop the relationship. But by having that in there, um, you have it pretty well, pretty well made. We can't. There's not much room for discussion, argument, or protest by the building official. What I do for my company, especially building products, my most valuable function is. Uh, as an engineer, what I do is answer taking questions all day about what you can and can't do and help people out like fine line after the fire they're doing some things and they had some stuff grandfathered in there that is a little abnormal with a whole you know bunch of PEX tubes for pop and stuff just things that you know had come about and been grandfathered in so I'll help out things like that but for like that Grand Park project I get together with Metropolitan Mechanical talk to the uh, project manager and the uh, guy in the job, job suit, try and find out exactly what he has. Get rid of, you know, because I just don't hand somebody the book and say, now you, you know, now you have your fire stop, because that's prohibitive. Nobody's going to do that. You'll fall asleep, you know, 250 times before you ever get through the book. Um, so I would ferret it down to you know, anywhere from, you know, 3 to 12 UL systems that will cover their application and try and pick the best ones. Some old ones, don't allow you off-center, don't allow you, and require more cost. I try and get the newest and best one for the application. And we'll see in the JIP wall, there's a lot of them that take only five-eighths for one or two hours. So, you know, they have a little cushion, go from line contact to an inch and a half gap. And those are the kind of ones I pick out. And they're not the ones that everybody picks up, because they'll go for the first one in the book. You know, I usually try and start at the back end and go the other way in the book. <laughs> what I did to try and do is so I get the newest stuff. So I put those some middle together, put cover letter package, table of contents, product data sheets, MSDS sheets, etc. And then give like 10 copies to one, <coughs> one for the architect, the building official, everybody. And uh, then usually things go pretty smoothly after that. And if there's any addendum changes, I'm uh, available to do that too. And again, focusing on, on the 3M products. And, uh, it can be a, a, you know, a messy little area, although things I think are getting easier all the time. So, um, I'll see if my little remote control thing will work. We'll back up if we need it again. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. This is normally a two-hour thing, so we're going to skip a lot of things and go pretty quick. So you stop me anytime you want to dwell on any particular subject about anything. And in my simplistic view of things, why do we fire stop? The public wants it. Now that's it. You, you and your families, when you get in buildings, want to be safe. Especially the taller the building, the more the concern. So we do it because the public wants it. And, and what is fire stopping? It's just one thing, containment. All it is, you have a fire rated wall or floor, you have to return that wall or floor to the fire rating it was originally designed to, and you do that by these various UL systems that we have. And so, fire stopping is just containment, and uh, it uh, is getting easier all the time, actually. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to get closer to that thing, I don't know why. Um, I'll just pick up a chair here and talk loud and everybody's going to uh, interrupt our 
or uh, tell me when they want to dwell on a particular subject. Uh, objectives of the class is to understand the need for fire stopping. Kind of briefly went over that. Uh, stick buildings. I don't know how many people here actually work on stick buildings, but uh, those are the ones that are, that are sometimes dramatic and more regular than, of course, the big buildings. Now, all these fires occurred, of course, before 9-11, and no building ever came down. And everybody was kind of lulled into the false sense of security. But you listen to the full tapes and, and on some of these uh, fires, and the firemen will evacuate a building after a certain point. The fireproofing, you know, is only designed for one, two, three hours, and they'll evacuate a building when they think they've exceeded that because they're afraid it will come down. It, none had happened. Of course, none had ever experienced quite the same uh, fuel load and everything that 9-11 did. Did anybody looking at 9-11 say that building's going to come down before it did? No. <laughs> now, there wasn't, wasn't really a whole lot of doubt about it in, in you know, Monday morning quarterbacking. It was just a matter of time, and lucky stayed up as long as it did with the kind of impact and fuel load it had in there. <clears throat> but there's been a lot of fires like this where the whole floor gets engulfed and you can see the fire around the whole building and you suspect that it could be a problem, a major problem. <coughs> of course, these are all old buildings that haven't been sprinkled or fire stopped, right? <coughs> you see the statistics and how much uh, business and life is lost and frequency of fires and in the industrialized countries, I think we're uh, fifth, six as far as uh, how well we're doing you know, compared to some of the European countries and stuff. We uh, haven't got the best uh, fire safety record around. I think some of the biggest losses occur uh, from a property standpoint or a financial standpoint is continuity of business. Businesses get shut down. And sometimes if they can't get back up and uh, start servicing the market for the customers they have, they can be out of business. So it's not just loss of inventory or property. Sometimes it's a uh, total, uh, total loss of the business because it's interrupted for a long time. And as you've probably heard many times, smoke is the biggest killer of everybody in a fire. It's at 67%, I've heard 80% in other times. The responsibility for fire stopping you know, added other things goes from the owner, specifier, general contractor, installer, a code official, and uh, the manufacturer, be it no matter who, it's 3M or anybody else. And it's not an easy thing to do, but... And there have been a number of cases since it's a life safety issue. Uh, if it isn't done right, you know, there could be uh, other consequences. Now, if we gave a test at the end, this would be in the test. <laughs> And, and I do, but I have to give it to uh, people for credit, so. Uh, life safety issue, of course, is uh, property protection and continuity of operation. The four things that go into uh, fire, uh, well, basically creating a safe building is education a little bit like we're doing now, uh, the detection system, the suppression system, which you're very familiar with, and then the containment, and that's where the fire stopping goes. We'll go quickly through things that don't apply to regular through penetration. Uh, again, they're reiterating the compartmentalization or containment as a uh, key to fire stopping for smoke and fire. Generally, when a fire occurs in a room, there's a, a high temperature and higher pressure uh, in the upper part of the room. And when it reaches about 1,000 degrees, all the stuff in the room starts off-gassing a little bit and you get a flashover, and that's when a pressure occurs. And that pressure uh, starts dramatically then, and it can force the fire through any openings into adjacent areas. And uh, I've talked to some firefighters that have actually seen it. I haven't actually seen it uh, occur in a, in a regular environment. 
environment. It's just a graphic uh, presentation of what happens. Uh, I've heard it actually does happen. Uh, fire stopping is, is a passive fire uh, con control. It basically just sits there. You don't have to do anything to it once it's installed. It just sits there and waits to do its job when and if it's ever asked to. Well, there's some hidden fun, uh, benefits of fire stopping too is you get better sound attenuation. Your air conditioning systems, hopefully if the design right, work better because there's not always hidden path for the air to go around in the building. And it can uh, stop some water damage if there's water on the floor. It may not progress down and down. And mechanical pipes, you probably just see uh, CPVC and, and metal. I presume that's mostly what you see. If you see any plastics, all CPVC. But you get into a mechanical contractor, and they have a lot of different ones, including ones they don't mention there, like fire rated polypropylene for chemicals. And the interesting thing about plastics is, you know, they're going to burn out at different temperatures. So the UL systems have to cater to the temperature and the burning characteristics of that plastic and have to be tested that way. So just because it would do PVC doesn't necessarily mean it can do CPVC, although it really does, because CPVC is actually better in a fire than PVC. And, uh, but for other cases, you have to do all of those different kinds of plastics, different kinds of insulation, and uh, different kinds of uh, even metals. Copper is uh, more, more challenging than steel is. You, uh, got the question, do you guys get into your uh, control systems a lot for your, your sprinkler system? Do you have the wiring responsibilities to it all? I'll go we'll, we'll quickly over that too then. Here are all the different codes are, and uh, I know we're, we're going to the ICC, but originally the government gets involved. Three codes are too many, and until the ICC is accepted, we have now at least four major codes out there. And I don't know, has California accepted the IC, uh, ICC? I heard they rejected it the first time around. I don't believe so. So who knows how long all this stuff is going to linger before it all gets taken care of. <coughs> These are the different sections. If you go read in the uh, uh, particular section 7, you can find a, a lot of interesting details about fire stopping. And you know what is the definition of uh, uh, smoke, uh, this, you know, smoke control or uh, things like that. It, it varies a lot. Uh, the ASTM systems for those tests are national systems, and the ASTM E119 is for walls and floors. So you test the wall and floor that way, but it has no through penetration. Then you go test the through penetration by themselves, and that's the top one, 814. And it follows the same time temperature curve, and it's hit by a whole string, it's a very severe test. During the fire test, the UL engineer is monitoring the performance of the test assembly. He'll closely monitor all data gathering equipment to see how temperatures are rising throughout the assembly. He will also be looking for cracks, openings, and flames on the unexposed surface of the test assembly. At the conclusion of the fire test, the sample is subjected to a 30 psi water hose stream test. This hose stream test is really just a means used to apply a loader force on the test specimen and is necessary to determine the ability of a fire stop device or system to resist forces that... You see that's a jip wall. The, the side facing you is the side of course that turns to uh, basically almost standing ash until it's hit by the hose stream and then it falls apart and the opposite side does the job. So you get that question, which side should you fire stop? Usually you gotta do both, unless you know which way the fire is coming. You might have some uh, chance of doing something differently, but basically you do both sides. And the home stream is to test the structural integrity of the fire stop after a fire, more than simulating a firefighting effort. It's to simulate the pressures that create in a, in a fire atmosphere, and, uh, and also make sure there's enough structural integrity left. Uh, one of the most common products that you'll see used is intermescent products. They expand with heat. You know, caulk three to five times, other things. A new graph strip, they have up to 25 times. But once it's all done, it has to have char strength. It has to have enough strength so it isn't just sitting around like a bowl of popcorn ready to blow away. 
it has to be all held together, you know, with some you know, some other magic ingredient. So when it all expands, you have something that's a uh, firm char when it's done. And those are the uh, time temperature curves. And the people that developed that originally did it based on going out and burning things. So they found out in the first five minutes, you, things can get pretty far out of control. You can get up to a thousand degrees is where the off-gassing starts to occur and then things get, uh, get ugly in a hurry. So your first hour is 1,700 degrees, second hour, uh, 1,850. Uh, some people say, can I use less fire stop for, 18, you know, for one hour if I have a two-hour system? Well, we'll get into it, but look at the UL systems. But basically, uh, the first hour is the toughest hour. If you survive that, you know, your chances of going uh, farther are pretty easy. You don't have to dramatically change things to get more uh, time out of your uh, fire stop test. You can see a four hour one, they even have a more severe test. I think it's actually a larger uh, hose and nozzle and 45 PSI. And again, any water going through to the opposite side, then you fail that test. And 3M has your own uh, test facility in Cottage Grove here. And they have all the data acquisition equipment. So they put the thermal couples all over the through penetrating items and the walls and uh, gather all the equipment. All they have to do is call in a UL engineer to witness the test. If he witnesses, takes all the data, and he makes sure everything is okay, they have a UL system that way. They can also test their failures that way too, I'm sure. <laughs> without the UL engineer. Um, another thing that comes into play sometimes is the T rating. I think the new codes are going to reduce emphasis on T rating, uh, but there's also T is the temperature transmitted, L is uh, actual uh, cubic feet of, uh, of gas that goes through that thing rather than just water, and there's another M rating for movement that's coming up because there isn't such a thing as a, really a static building. The T rating uh, generally isn't going to force a whole bunch, but uh, that can be a problem sometimes in where you have a sea of desks. Like last time I got involved with it was at one of the Target centers where Target people or Dayton people are so style conscious they couldn't drop all their wires from the ceiling, you know, even though after a week you wouldn't know if they're coming from the ceiling or the floor. But um, so they had to come through the floor, and then you have temperature transmitted. When you have a sea of desks like that, it might become a concern. So occasionally, but only occasionally, T ratings come into effect. And that's a 325 degree uh, delta. That's over ambient. So if ambient 75, when it hits 400 degrees, then your T rating, you fail. They measure it every 15 minutes. And so you'll see T ratings a quarter, half, or zero, or whatever. And for most metal pipe penetrations, you're going to have zero. You know, it just conducts too much heat. And why did they come up with T ratings? Who cares? It's not that it's going to kill the people on the other side, and it could auto-ignite something on the other side. That's the problem. And they don't want you to auto-ignite. And the 400 degrees was picked because that's theoretically the uh, auto-ignition temperature of virgin cotton, and that came out of the textile industry. So that's, that's how that happened. Um, and we have to live with it now. It's probably a good thing, but it isn't really a big problem most of the time. Most of the building officials uh, know that, and, and it isn't really enforced that much. It'll be interesting to see how the new codes are written, to see how much emphasis they put on it. I believe it's going to be downgraded. When you do a wall test, you can do a large, if you have the right oven, you can do a very large wall test. Test several things, from cable trains, insulated pipe, regular pipes, conduits, whatever you want. You know, I beam in there, and each one is judged individually. So if one fails, that doesn't mean the whole thing fails. Just that particular through pen failed. And if there is a problem, sometimes it becomes dramatic, and so you uh, <laughs> you know you have a problem. You don't have to wait for the whole screen test. Here's a slab. They have to make a slab. Let it cure for a minimum 30 days, put the holes in, put the pipe in, try and create a real life situation, and it's a very severe test. They'll set this on top of an oven and simulating a floor burn, and they've had fire stopping on the top side, and then they'll uh, burn it for whatever it is, one, two, three hours. When they take it out, it's going to be glowing hot. If there's a uh, bundle of cables, 
sometimes they're still burning because there's a lot of energy in the uh, you know, outer PVC jacketing of uh, cables. Then they take it out, usually within 15 minutes, they have it out there and hit it with a hose screen to see if it passes. Here's a smaller wall test that they're preparing to do. And to get it outside, and I believe this one is done down inside the grove or candlelight. Because it kind of looks like a Minnesota winter. <laughs> and they hit it with the uh, fireman's hose and uh, see if it passes. You can see that in a regular stud wall, even wood studs, you know, will survive. And that's why you can see in the uh, design of the wall, the U400 or U300, the wall designs for uh, steel or wood studs. But again, you can see how everything has kind of disappeared on the fire side, too. <coughs> the difference between a one-hour and two-hour jib wall, sometimes people in the past, anyway, have said, I have a UL system that says I can do a two-hour jip wall. And so I'm assuming that's good for a one-hour also. But that's not really the case. When you see a UL system, make sure it's one and two-hour if that's what you want. Reason being is, if you look at it, you have two sheets of sheetrock, you know, on a two-hour. If you have to put an inch and a quarter deep of caulk in there to solve your fire stop problem, um, you can't put an inch and a quarter of caulk in a one-hour wall. It's only got five eighths land area. So there are differences between a wall, especially jip. We have to make sure. In concrete, if you have a three-hour, it's good for two or one. But in gypsum, you really have to make sure it's for the hour rating you desire, because the two-hour is not automatically good for a one-hour. Uh, here's a, a new product they're working on. It's uh, uh, ignition of the door phase on the non-fire side. <coughs> small thing driven out of the top of the assembly can fail the excessive small criteria. Caps or leaks could open <coughs> flames and hot gases to escape from the furnace that would be sufficient to ignite. So you can see there's a pressure of a fire. The, yeah, the door is good, the wall is good, but there's a gap there. You get on fire. What's different in the testing? Let's talk about and smoke going through there. <clears throat> so they have a tape intumescent product put around there and then it will expand, fill the void around the door and, uh, you know, and it gives you a better safety. Hospitals are looking at it, other people are looking at it. Somebody asked, uh, well, if that expands, maybe I won't be able to get out of the room that locks the door, so I can't get out. But if you follow that logic through, you're already dead, so I don't know how much that matters. Because if you're on the wrong side of that thing, it gets hot and into mess, you know, <clears throat> you don't want to open the door from either side. You couldn't from the inside because you wouldn't survive that. And the other side, you don't want to let the, uh, you don't want to feed the fire with more uh, oxygen. <clears throat> when I first got involved in fire stopping, it actually confused the hell out of me. <laughs> there were so many different things. So, so finally I did, and, and now they're doing uh, this. Break the products into categories on what they do. There are products that are intumescent, expand with heat. There are ones that are endothermic, absorb heat. There's ones that are just basically a seal. And then there's ablative ones that actually turn to ash and kind of form their own insulation. And then they have the insulated ones. This is a uh, composite sheet. It expands about 10 times its own volume uh, when heated up. Example of an endothermic material gives off uh, water and absorbs a lot of heat during a fire by uh, changing phase, changing the liquid to a gas, and that takes about 80 times the energy it does to change one degree uh, Fahrenheit centigrade. I mean. um, here's a silicone type of product you see them use sometimes for a blade. Of um, you put in, I know some of the UL system, inch and a half of silicone. And normally silicone is going to disappear in a fire because it, even the fire stop silicone doesn't take, you know, it's not magic silicone, it doesn't take 2,000 degrees. If it did, it'd be a hell of a lot more valuable. Um, but you put it in there, it forms its own ash and its own char and its own insulation. So you have an ablative material. This is going to stay cool enough on the top because as you remember, that floor can't reach 400 degrees because that T rating applies to floors and walls uh, also. 
uh, it will stay cool enough where you'll have a, a bond and a seal and you'll have a legitimate fire sap from a bladed material that tends to deteriorate in a fire. Also, once upon a time, the first reentry vehicles we had in space had a blade of materials on there. Um, it was a PTFE uh, Teflon material, and it would heat a blade and, and char off, and when you get to the ground, you'd have to replace your heat shield. And that seemed too expensive, so they decided to go back to a ceramic design. But I always kind of liked the ablated design, because you kind of really knew where everything was at, and uh, you start fresh every uh, reentry. Here's some of the insulated materials. Uh, I don't know if you've got familiar with any of them, but uh, you'll see those in some of your projects on, around grease ducts. And some of the materials almost, uh, are almost like a ceramic. They can wrap around a grease duct. They'll take the 2,000 degree temperature uh, and uh, it, it won't fall apart. And they do that instead of putting a uh, shaft around there, because a shaft takes up a lot of room and it's uh, pretty expensive. The three and five price is again just under what it costs to put up a shaft. So, uh, but you know it has a lot of other advantages. You have a lot more floor space. It's easier to install. It's actually quite a bit less expensive. So, uh, and that's the American way. It's competition. You know, so no matter what, uh, eventually you're going to have competition, and the price is going to go down to what it costs to make and test and uh, support. Here's examples of the different materials put in a uh, uh, through pen cross section. And you can see the first one, of course, being the intumescent product, probably the most, pro most popular product in the world, 3MC B25. It has that rust red look to it. You've probably all seen it. And then what did some other manufacturers do? <laughs> they made all the products red. You know, 3M tries to break their products into uh, color category. So when you go around, you can see what's put in. Is it acrylic latex? Is it a silicone? Is it a, a spray? You know, and they're all trying to be different colors. There are two inches of products. The putty and the cock are about the same color. Uh, next, you see the silicone. Uh, they're showing the char in there. It, same thing can happen with some water-based products. Uh, the fourth one over is a lightweight mortar product. <coughs> and some people say, well. Why do I have to do a, why can't I just use concrete instead of fire sapping? Well, concrete doesn't tend to bond, it tends to shrink and it tends to crack. If it's original pour, it's a fire sap. If it's not original pour, then uh, it hasn't been, it hasn't passed tests, people have tried it and it just doesn't, doesn't make it. This particular lightweight mortar expands, when it's curing, expands with heat and gets, has ceramics in it, so it gets, when it gets hot, it tends to get tougher with heat. So it is a bit of a different product. The one on the far right is a two-part silicone from now pointing that 3M has now. You mix it up, in about 30 seconds it starts to pop, two minutes it's popped three to one in volume, and it's the first fire stop out. The first fire stop was done in a nuke plant because they almost lost a nuke plant, and they, because they didn't have control over fire once it started. And they realized uh, dramatically that uh, you know, they were lucky they didn't have anything lost, but that they had to do something about fire going, you know, room to room, floor to floor. And it was uh, nuke plants, and that's probably the most popular product in a, in a nuclear facility is that particular product. You'll notice in the UL systems that to set the depth, you put in something occasionally, like a backer rod, or maybe nothing of this type, or maybe even fiber. But you just want to set the depth so you don't have your uh, contractor or your, usually a little guy in the totem pole, the apprentice out there, filling the whole floor with expensive fire stop car. But there's also another reason. Sometimes you need the thermal protection, protection of a mineral wool or a ceramic because you're dealing with materials that are either temperature sensitive, or there are UL systems where you can get by with half the caulk if you put in just two inches of mineral wool, just half the caulk you'd normally use. But these have a kind of a hierarchy. So if somebody says that mineral wool is okay, is fiberglass? No, but ceramic is. If back of rod is okay, you know, then uh, fi uh, fiberglass, mineral wool, or ceramic are okay. If it calls for ceramic, you can't use mineral wool or fiberglass. So it's a one-way deal. So if you see that in the UL system, it starts substituting anything, 
uh, you'd have to go kind of on that curve. To get right down to a stack of rod and nothing are about the same. Stack of rods even worse than nothing, I think, because it contributes to the fire burns. Usually they're polyurethane or uh, another combustible plastic. When you go look at your applications, you have to find, uh, I actually simplify the one, two, three. What are you penetrating? What's penetrating it? And then how do you solve the problem? This is dwelling on the thing that's penetrating it. What's the size of it? What's the, what's the space around it? In the, in the case of cables, well, you know, what is the amount of cable fill? How severe is the fire? One, two, three hour? So you get your size and your penetrating item and, and what it's made out of. Uh, just for your information, cables, uh, there's about two to one ratio. Whatever you see, if you see 40, 50, 60, 80 percent, it's actually about half of that. If you took every cable out, measured the cross-sectional area. You know, and I did, that was just the way I don't take things for granted and I don't necessarily believe what I'm told. So uh, that's a rule of thumb. So if you saw one about 100% uh, fall, it would be actually probably about 50, maybe 60% of actual cables in there. <coughs> Here's another thing then, the, and the way things uh, were tested in the past. The way things were tested in the early days was ideal lab conditions. Things were centered. You know? And some people are still using old systems that have a requirement like that. Almost all the new systems go to a range on your annulus. Annulus, of course, is your radial distance. So your range is usually from zero to inch and a half, something like that. And usually you just use a one over uh, core to drill something anyway. So if you have a two inch, you use a three inch core. So you should have probably less than an inch of annulus max. So a good zero to an inch should cover almost all your applications if they drill the holes properly. That range uh, is an important thing. And there are some systems that don't allow that, so you have to make sure you've got the one you want. Here's what they call point contact. Now, I know there's a lot of P's and stuff around here. You know, there's, that's a two-dimensional two world. We live in a three-dimensional world. It's actually line contact. But we're not going to uh, change uh, anybody's way of uh, looking at it. Everyone else lives in a 2D world, I guess. So we'll just call it point contact. Sleeves can be good and bad. In the, in the scenario I'm bringing up right now, we're going to say, what is the negative of having a sleeve in there? Well, sometimes you have to have a sleeve because it's a requirement of the building. But right over here, this is going to be under 400 degrees in the normal floor. You're going to have a, a thermal conducting item that's steel, but it's going to be, have a lot of heat absorbed by the concrete. Pipe's going to generate a lot of heat. Put them together, and they're going to generate a hell of a lot of heat. So that's probably going to be a hotter spot than if you didn't have a sleeve. If you look at it, there aren't many silicone systems you can go point contact there because there's too much heat. So you, again, you have to look at the, your UL system and see if it allows you to go point contact because there are some things that can occur that are kind of negative for some products. There's all the different kinds of floors and, uh, you know, our, uh, the first time I saw a two and a half inch concrete floor was Mall of America. And if you go on the balcony around Mall of America, you can find places that are almost like a trampoline. You know, if you jump there, you can, you can, you can feel the floor move. But it's been up long enough where I guess uh, they knew what they were doing. Um, but you know that's going to get up more heat. So you, again, you look at the thickness of the floor and make sure it's uh, compatible with, with what you uh, have for a UL system. <clears throat> if you have a fluted pan deck, you look at the minimum distance. Uh, you don't look at the, thick, the thickest part, you look at the thinnest part, and that's your deck thickness. Precast concrete, you hollow core. Um, you only have small land areas. If you don't have a sleeve in there, uh, you only have like, an inch, inch and a quarter land area. Uh, the UL system should say, Precast. If you're going to do precast, they had to have tested it that way. There are a couple of UL systems that allow you to do bottom side only, CAJ 1175. But it seems like the majority of building officials have it in their head. They want top and bottom done. 
and uh, you can argue with them, you can show them the system, you can try and prove your point, but don't be too surprised if you end up doing top and bottom anyway. But uh, usually I'll put that in as an option, especially in stick buildings where they're doing a lot of underground uh, parking. You know, they have a three hour concrete floor and they want to do bottom side only. They're talking about uh, walls. They'll talk about the difference between rated and non rated wall. But <clears throat> if you're in a rated wall with plastic, you can go up to four inch with just a bead of car. Because what happens is that pipe will burn so slow and it'll, it'll, it'll form its own plug and charge in there. And people didn't know that until about five years ago. And everyone's putting expensive devices in there. Now you can find a UL system, uh, CAJA. Uh, 2034 that does just 2134 that does just a beat of car. So you can do a, an awful lot these days with uh, very little. Electric outlet boxes. They have nothing to do with you, but just for the hell of it, I, I want to bring up an interesting point. When I first looked at it, they put those pads on the electric outlet box. If you have more than 16 square inches in a 100 square feet of area or more than two in one cavity, and anybody know why they do that? You know, to me, I thought this is this isn't legit. They're going to allow a metal box, one box in there. What's wrong with having two boxes in there? What happens is, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. You have to imagine another sheet of sheetrock over here. If there's too much metal here, it's going to conduct so much heat. You're going to prematurely dry out this wall. It's going to be hit to the whole stream. It's going to go right through both walls. So you'll prematurely dry out, and that's how kind of, uh, uh, gets weak and fails. You prematurely dry it out, too much heat, and you'll uh, fail the fire test. And it wouldn't be as safe as safe the environment. That's why they put uh, those multiple putty pads, which expand and, form and become an insulator. They'll expand uh, you know, about five times, and they'll be a thermal insulator so you don't conduct all that heat. They're trying to say that the tube clock is not a fire stop, a system is. And a system, if you look at it, it actually dictates the wall, the floor, the through penetrating item, the cop, mineral wall, whatever, and the dimensions on all of the above. There's more than one agency that uh, is uh, listing fire stop. UL is the biggest, and UL is uh, probably the best in that they're most conservative. You don't find any questionable things or things in UL. But other people have that capability, and the uh, ICB or ICC recognizes them. They give them NER numbers saying, you're qualified to test uh, lamps and fire stopping, or whatever it might be. Ladders, you know, you have to be able to do that ASTM 8814 test and be qualified to do it. They'll give you your NER number. And then you have that, you can start listing your uh, results of your testing. Nineteen ninety-three, UL decided they had a book. They're not not as big as the one now, but the, the numbers were just sequential. Had no no rhyme or reason. You could have a jib wall, plastic penetration next to a. Uh, you know, electric bus through a four-hour concrete floor. It had no rhyme or reason. So what they decided to do is make a kind of alphanumeric uh, pattern out of it. So if you flip open a book, you know, in your case, unless the first number is one or two, you probably don't care. Because uh, we'll get into what the numbering system means in just a second. But you look at the um, lettering system, and it's given that one, two, three. One, what are you penetrating? And that it says you're, you're penetrating C means combination floor and wall. The only similar product for combination wall and floor is concrete. So that means it's also going to be concrete. And if it's uh, F, rather than a C, it'd be floor, and a W, it would be a wall. And we'll see what the what next set of letters means. So now you know if it's going to be a wall, floor, or a combination. 
So the next layer is going to be the thickness of the floor. Five inches or less would be A. You almost always use A. Thick floors would be B. The next letter is a J. That's a block wall. Right, your eight inch block wall. So CAJ is your most commonly used UL uh, two penetration item as far as concrete goes. Then we're going to talk what that number means next. If it's zero, it's a blank opening, maybe for future use, if somebody made a mistake, put a hole in that they didn't want to put it in. Um, one is going to be metal. Metal is a non-consumed you know, non metal. It really doesn't include aluminum, but uh, they, I think they might even have it in there. But basically, it's always, always steel, copper. So that'd be steel pipes, iron pipes, conduits, uh, EMT. Two is going to be your plastic. So that's what almost all the time you're going to be interested in. If somebody brings up a system that's uh, you have a metal through pipe penetration and they bring up a CAJ2, you can automatically you know, dismiss it. Uh, three is cable, four is cable tray, five is insulated pipe, six is electric bus, seven is HVAC ducting, and eight is combination system, where they took and made a giant opening and they put everything in that opening almost. And most people don't get into the eights, but uh, I occasionally get into them for uh, some of the best buy job on the streets of me and some other ones. Here is one of your UL systems. This was kind of interesting. You see it's CAJ2, so you know it's plastic pipe. And then the last three digits are sequential, so you know it's the first one ever done. Yeah. And they still have it out there. They upgrade these systems with time. Uh, this one is for larger pipes. And that's why you have a device around there, like the one I uh, had out here. You can pass that around too if you want to. And that has a highly intermessive material inside here that will expand and shut off the void. Um, some people say, can you put that on the top? And you think, well, let's think about it. And then you think, no, it's intermessive. Have to see the heat to do its job. Have to be down in the heat. Can't be up there. Sometimes you can, if you have enough space around here, you can take the same material, again, look at the UL system, shove it up in the gap and it may get hot enough. But uh, generally, that has to see the heat to do its job. This is also another unique one in that it says precast in here. Um, and it doesn't say anything about having to go seal the top. So theoretically, you wouldn't have to do that. Uh, a lot of other systems, you have to seal the top, but this doesn't reference it at all. It's a long system, and you can see again, all the different kinds of uh, plastic. It has the diameter of the plastic, uh, or your uh, wall floor thicknesses, and then the type of device to solve that problem. So who can tell me what this one's for? CAJ1, you know. Uh, we know it's a combination, concrete, wall, or floor, and it's a metal pipe application. That'd be the test too if we're going to do one. But you guys are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it is an overview of all the different products, from the pillows to the uh, putty to the device, you know, to your, uh, you know, all your products, they don't have the new product in there. You know, that's only been out for about six months or so. I guess they haven't updated their CD yet. But here's their insulating material, here's their endothermic material. And you look at it, you, know, you realize that they've had to spend a, a lot of time, a lot of effort to put together the right products to solve all the problems out there. Here's a little bit, we're going to talk about the pillows. I'm going to go quickly over that. How far am I over here so far? You have three different pillow designs. Conceivable, you could use one someday, but...
Another example of the whole stream test is that case using fellows. Blank openings. And the fellows have an intermescent material in there, so the pillows expand. They have a thin sheet on either side of the uh, basically mineral wall, high, high, high caliber mineral wall that has a good rebound. You can feel a thin sheet of intermescent in there. So it will expand with heat also and lock itself in there. You don't need any wire mesh to hold that particular product in place like some of the other manufacturers do. Just examples of uh, what CP25 does. You know, it does a small copper pipe. It can do an insulated pipe up to a certain amount. There's a uh, plastic insulation. Regular through floor penetration. Again, that can be up to a four inch PVC. And that guy, he's not gonna get any prizes for beauty on that. <laughs> but again, it's gonna be all boarded in and who cares? As long as he's got adequate amount in there. <clears throat> There's a, a full load of cables, uh, rectangular openings, wall tops, gaps, joints. That's uh, one of their new water-based products. And the putty, the putty's nice because you can re-enter. Like if you're gonna have a low volt wiring in there and they're gonna re-enter because of communications, uh, more computer lines, whatever, you can re-enter a uh, putty hole easily and there's some specific designs that are designed uh, so they can do that. The low volt people use those a lot. And the picture of the box. This is our composite sheet for large opening, basically 18 gauge galvanized steel with a quarter inch of intermescent on it uh, to absorb the heat. You can put that over large openings. You put it two inches over the edge of the hole, then uh, you send a washer, bolt it down, and seal it in with a little cock. That. Anyway, I just put men, uh, putting putty down around there. Here's uh, one of their new devices. Uh, they've had a previous kind of uh, device with different material in it. This has a unique hole down, and you can see the new type. And this would be in the test too. That you know that their new product expands about 25 times. Caulk was three to five. Their old intermescent wrap was about 10, and the new is about 25 times. This shows you a uh, PVC pipe burning off. And again, you guys are lucky because you have closed systems. The plumber sometimes have open systems, i.e. a dead pipe to the roof is gonna burn more uh, easily than a pipe full of water. So uh, you guys have uh, the best of all worlds there as far as plastic goes. Obviously burned off, intimate, shut off, you can see here, it even got hot enough to intermess a little bit and neck that down. But it passed the test and uh, everything went okay. I had guys uh, try and say, well, we don't have to fire stop plastic pipes because we put metal in the hole. So they'll put a section of metal in here and plastic on both sides. Well, that isn't going to work. The plastic is going to burn off in a vented situation. Enough of the fire is going to come through and burn through this side because it isn't going to be shut off. So, even though I bet it would work if you had enough pipe, metal, but I don't know how much that is and nobody's really tested it, so it's not really accepted. You can make your own device too, if you have some unique sizes. But here, our labor costs are such that we don't make our own devices very often. This is the other test too. What's the big PVC pipe? You can generally you can do it. It's in the UL book. Ten inch. Can you imagine a ten inch PVC pipe and that open? You know, I mean flames can roar through it, and you have to shut down. 
what they do is take two of those collars, stack them on top of each other, run two of them around there. And then uh, I give them the new one, they don't require it, but in the old one, they put uh, a little fiberglass around to slow the burning and melting up so the intimescent could have time to shut everything off properly. Again, you have to look at the UL system, but 10 inches is about the biggest one out there. It's a composite sheet they use on, on large areas. Until somebody gets used to it, and even after you take a piece of cardboard, you know, cut it out to fit, and then after you got a cardboard fit, then you go cut the expensive stuff. You've got, you got really good at it. I remember out uh, Mall of America, Sterling Electric, you know, I, I don't know if this is them, but they got that good at it where it was actually uh, looking good. And they use it a lot in telecommunication. That was a, a large hole. You know, here, here's something that, you know, I don't know if it would ever happen to you, but somebody comes along and does you a favor and jackhammers a hole out for you. Well, even if they did it for nothing, you lost money. Because the fire stop in a regular large opening becomes a real problem. So you want to have your things, you know, core drilled and close to the size that you, you can for the kind of products that you're using. And that's what happens if you don't fire stuff. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. At least you got to do one of them, I guess. So I tried to uh, get through everything fairly quickly. And uh, you now again, three of another company. Now, I, I don't work for 3M. Uh, I work for special building products. But 3M is one of the companies I work with. And you can see all the things that a uh, uh, legitimate company has to offer. I've worked with about all of them out there. And I think. Uh, the two that I've liked so far are W.R. Grace and 3M. Those are the two good companies out there. The rest of them, you know, I've, I've dumped and left and we just, I don't work with them. So, uh, but those, those are the 3M. And you can see the kind of stuff they have, the auto fax. If you know how to use that, you can have a, uh, their computer fax, one of the UL drawings, any, any fax machine. They have their website. They have uh, teaching aids like this. They have their specifier guides and CD-ROMs. And again, I have a bunch of CD-ROMs I brought along. Uh, swap them for a business card if you want, you know, or, or whatever. And you find all this in, in, in the literature, the information they have. Now, do you feel like you've been to a two-hour class? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if you're going really going into the stop fire penetration for people that are doing electrical, all the group pen type stuff, have to slow up and take a lot more time with this stuff. But that's the crux of it. So when I got in, invited here, it reminded me in a one hour deal or so, um, of a, a whole thing that Hubert Humphrey said, if uh, you need a speech, a three hour speech, I can give it to you anytime. If you need a 10 minute speech, it'll take me days to prepare it. <laughs> And so I tried to crush this down to one hour. Hopefully it didn't uh, lose any of the uh, meaning or the important things that maybe you were looking for. So any questions? Yes, sir. When you're doing the training for the installers themselves, um, is there an actual practical aspect to the program as well as this that drills with tests? Uh, there's different levels of training you can get. The one that I do is I can't use a test facility and have them go down there and do hands-on fire stopping, you know, and go to a, another level of training. So this is basically the crux of what, what I end up doing. But there is another level of training down at uh, Kemalite or uh, Cottage Grove where you go there for two days. You do one day of <laughs> this and more and another day of actual fire stopping where you'll have a floor wall, you have pipes and holes, and, you know, you have to go to the book, pull your UL system up, actually fire stop it, then they'll put it on the oven, burn it right in front of you, show all the data acquisition equipment, take it out and test it, and you can see if you pass. But uh, the, whether you pass or not isn't as important as all the learning that goes on. Hands-on learning, you can't beat hands-on learning. 
where people are actually going to do it. I intentionally failed my <laughs> Just to prove a point, because they make me mad sometimes. And uh, what I had is a large plastic pipe. So I put the pipe device around it, and it said uh, that particular one you had to put in like three screws, right? Two, three, two screws, I said. And it had four tabs and two screws. So I said, it should say symmetric, but it doesn't. Why does it say symmetric? So I put two screws on one side. You know, it didn't mess so much, it pulled itself right off the head and failed. You know, because it wasn't symmetrically attached. You know, and I guess uh, that's just a personal problem I have. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully the people in the field would have more common sense than that. Um, I think it would go much too many Any other question? What's your experience in looking at real life scenarios where people have you know, like, said this is why the lock? You see that it's, it's getting better because people are getting better and the systems are getting simpler. It used to be that you know, a significant amount was, uh, I can tell you a story about that. Dow Corning had a, it was in the business at one time, they had a wrap strip, you know, kind of like 3M's wrap strip, but different, made by somebody else with different technologies. They found that that wrap strip, after five years, wouldn't into mess as well. And Dow Corning being used to legal action, once that was a, <laughs> once that was in their corporate archive, they know they were screwed, you know? And, and so they knew that the fact that they had tested it mean is they had to do something about it. If they didn't know it, you go on that dumb and happy. But they knew it, it was in their archives, so they had to do something about it. They got out of the business. They said, you know, because that time they were having other legal problems. And uh, in fact, they still are, I think. But, uh, so they decided to get out of the business. And they basically sold their silicone line to 3M and bagged their uh, rat strip. But you, that's not really quite adequate. They had to go around, I had to go through every record I had and find everybody that ever bought that. They did it nationwide. And letters were sent to all the building owners that this was ever used on, saying that they would pay for and replace any rat strip uh, that was installed correctly. Nobody took them up on it. <laughs> because what, what is your win on that one? You know, if you're a building owner, you know, they'll go in there and they'll say, well, they didn't have the silicone all the way around for a smoke seal. They didn't have enough of this. They didn't have this right. You know, the annulus wasn't, was too big. You know, it, uh, at that time, and it was a more difficult world then, uh, people weren't as confident and uh, Dow did a little homework and figured a way they could keep everybody from asking them to go redo everything. So they said if it was done correctly, we will replace it. And uh, you know, that's just well, that's what they they had to do. They had to do. So they kind of stood up to the plate and hope nobody was pitching them. <laughs> anyway, um, but I think today's world are getting much better. The building officials are a little bit better, which forces everybody. Like building official has a at the he's about as popular as a cop is on a, on a, on a, on a fast freeway. He uh, had to go out and do that, but uh, they're getting more educated, more uniform. I would have bet when I started 15 years ago, it'd be perfect now. But it's, it isn't even close to perfect yet. But it's a whole lot better than it was. Uh, any architects or engineers? Is that one in the room for design? When I first got into business, I thought, okay, here's the ideal world. The architect should tell you exactly what a UL system to use. You, know, you shouldn't have to go around and figure anything out, or the engineers should tell you. But uh, that's part of the reason I got in it. They haven't got the time to do that correctly either. And when they tried to do it, they screwed it up more than they got it right. And plus, if they did it two years ago, there might be something new now that a contractor could submit that would meet the building codes and UL requirements and whatever the uh, wording is in, in the uh, uh, specification that would uh, be safer, better, and less expensive. So it kind of has gone full circle and is back to the contractor almost having to pick and choose. He looks over the spec, and what I, I think uh, they should put two, three good manufacturers in there because there's too many other ones that aren't good, and then let the, uh, the contractors accept, accept and figure out what they want to use. Um, I know 
3 m those they you know they like to do the 3 m and every manifestation would but they should put in a few good ones and then the actual work is going to be done maybe by by yourself you know, in a lot of cases to pick and choose the best one for yourself then when you get your crews trained you know trained out there you don't have to train them on every job for a different product you know and that's one thing good about I don't want to talk too much. It's good about 3M is they're almost approved on every project. The guys get to know how to use that, you know, and they get used to maybe, in your case, half a dozen UL systems at the most. You'd have everything, everything done, and they wouldn't have to be retrained, and you just have to retitle your submittal, you know, put a new, a new project name on it. But, and that's what I do, you know, and I just suggest, uh, you know, Maybe use me or as a resource or somebody uh, that can keep you up to date as things change and get better. Three M's coming out with a new low cost intermessent product, the yellow rather than red. They haven't got three hour concrete yet, so I'm not doing anything with it. But one of these days, when it, when when they've uh, got all the ducts lined up, that's going to be a change. That's going to save everybody 20 percent of material maybe. So it's always changing and uh, usually it's getting better. That's a new result. But uh, any other question? Anybody not get what they want out of this? Anybody? Is there something else I should have put in, added, or not covered? Or is this kind of what you were looking for? OK. Well, again, got some uh, cards uh, up here and uh, letter openers and there's some CD rounds. And if you want anything else, let me know. And uh, I'll be happy to help you out anytime, anytime I can. Thank you, Alan. Um, we have basically two more.